we're going to welcome back Dr. Mel uh, Melanie Harvey. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to get to our artist panel, uh, where we will be bringing together uh, three artists to talk about the ways in which they're intervening in the in the archives. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them, and we can have them come up. Uh, and we'll begin actually with Larry Cook. Larry Cook received his MFA from George Washington University in 2013. A 2016 Stodham finalist and formal Hamilton Hamiltonian fellow from 2013 to 2015, he has been included in various group shows, um, and including How We Lost DC at the Hahn Floor Gallery, The Image of the Black at Gallery Mertice in Baltimore, and Artist Citizen at Hemp Hill Fine Art Gallery. Cook has also uh, had solo exhibitions at Hamiltonian Gallery, uh, Emerge Art Fair, Stamp Gallery, Pleasant Plains Workshop. In 2004, he had a large-scale public artwork on view as a part of the Ceremonies of Dark Men, part of a five-by-five five project public art that was curated by A.M. Weaver and organized by the D.C. Art Commissions. He's a native of Landover, Maryland, uh, and Larry, Larry has taught photography at George Washington University, American University, and is currently a visual arts teacher at Northwestern High School in Hyattsville, Maryland, and he's represented by Gallery Mertice uh, in Baltimore. So he will be our first speaker. Our second speaker will be Aziza Claudian Gibson Hunter. Aziza Claudia Gibson Hunter attended Tyler College of Art and graduated from Temple University. Claudia extended or attended graduate school at Howard University and moved to Harlem, New York after. After completing her MFA in printmaking, she studied in Bob Blackburn's printmaking studio and later received a fellowship from the Bronx Museum of Art. She joined Where We At Black Women Artists, a noted collective of black women artists as well. In 1987, she returned to DC to raise her family. In 1999, she was invited to take an adjunct position at Howard University to teach printmaking. While at Howard University teaching, she completed a residency with the Canadian School for Non-Toxic Printmaking with Keith, Keith Howard. Uh, she, has a, she has been awarded two grants within the university, one to install a non-toxic printmaking equipment. Uh, Howard University has become one of the few non-toxic printmaking studios in the country. In 2002, she decided to pursue her art, ma art making full time. In 2003, um, her focus became painting. Uh, by 2005, she's combining printmaking and assemblage with, assemblage with painting and moving into mixed media works. She then exhibited in DC, Maryland, New York, Illinois, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Texas, Florida, Great Britain, Argentina, and Poland. She is one of the 10 artists chosen to create digital, a digital print portfolio with David Adamson for the DC Commission on Art. She completed a banner for the Washington DC Art Walk as a part of a public installation piece. She is a co-founder of Black Artists of DC and she represented this organization during Art Basel Miami in 2006. Uh, in 2010, she took a residency with Pyramid Atlantic where she studied printmaking. Her work is included in the Washington DC Art Bank, the John A. Wilson Building Permanent Collection and other notable collections. And our last speaker on this panel will be Margaret Rose Ventries. Margaret Rose Ventries was born in Jamaica, Wisconsin. Oh, it says Wisconsin on here. Oh my. That's why I was like Jamaica, Wisconsin. Jamaica, West Indies. My apologies. And this is, wow. Okay, my apologies. She, she holds a PhD in art history from Princeton University, an MA in art history from Tulane University, and a BA in fine arts from Amherst College. Vendries joined the faculty of York College, CUNY, in 2000 and is currently the chair of the Department of Performing and Fine Arts and the director of the Fine Arts Gallery. She is, an, she is a historian, critic, curator, and multimedia artist whose work is enhanced by her scholarly engagement with African aesthetics. 
and its interaction with black popular music and visual culture. Vendries has lectured about art and art history across the US and abroad and exhibited in New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Houston, Biloxi, New Orleans, and Minnesota. Vendries also is the author of Barthé, a Life in Sculpture, the seminal monograph on the late African-American figurative artist, James Richmond Barthé. She lives and works in Queens, New York, and is represented by Tucker Contemporary Art Gallery uh, in New York and Child's Gallery in Boston. So help me welcome Larry Cook, who will give our first presentation. Um, when I was asked to uh, talk about my work, um, you know, I was really honored. It is a, it's extremely honored, uh, a privilege to be part of the Porter Colloquium. Um, someone asked me if I was nervous uh, coming up here, and during the week I wasn't. When I walked in and saw Fred Wilson and David Driscoll, things began to kind of tense up. Uh, if Thelma Golden walks in, I might need some help finishing my presentation. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I was speaking with uh, one of my um, collective members of Jimmy Richmond Edwards about uh, why I chose this particular body of work to discuss with you guys and um, it's very personal to me um, and uh, so really what I'm going to start by is why I kind of got into um, using found photography and archival footage. Um, anyone that knows my work um, I'm really based in portrait photography so I'm really based in portrait photography um, but I was also really inspired by artists like Carrie Mae Weems, um, an artist like Joaquin Smith, um, and using found material and found photographs. Uh, but I, I didn't really have a, a strong source material that really grabbed my attention. And um, in the year 2011, two of my uncles who were incarcerated, um, one who was incarcerated for 18 years, one who was incarcerated for 11 years, they came home one in 2010 and one in 2011. And when they came home, this is my uncle here. And when they came home, they had these huge stacks of photo albums from their time in prison. Uh, one was in the Maryland Correctional Institute um, institution in Hagerstown, and the other was in uh, Lewisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so, I mean, it was probably like their Bible. Um, everywhere they went, being fresh home from prison, they had these photographs with them. Um, so they would go through and always talk about, you know, the stories associated with these images, uh, the particular characters, um, and it was a lot of pride uh, in these particular images and this collection that they had. And I began to realize that this was, you know, a really rich source of material that I could probably use to kind of conceptualize some of the um, ideas that's embedded in this particular work. So my uncle was here, uh, Almonte Postel. Um, so one of the things that was really fascinating um, was the collage element of uh, their work. Um, so they would have these photographs, but then they would cut out magazines and different texts and paste them onto the images. Um, Another element that was really rich was the text or the letters that would be on the back of these photographs. Um, so this is my uncle writing to my other uncle in prison and the correspondence between the two. Um, so I began to think about, even though initially a lot of the stories that they would convey um, was really about like the machismo and bravado and toughness that you have to kind of portray being in prison. Uh, but one of the threads that I found really important was the aspect of family and brotherhood that is really essential to surviving um, this type of environment. So I began to really focus in on the visitation photographs uh, because in, in prison you have these two aspects where you have a photographer that goes around the yard taking photographs within a photographer that's present in the visiting room. Um, so I wanted to really focus on that and also the relationship between my uncle and them maintaining their relationship with family um, outside and uh, during their uh, stint in prison. So this is my uncle here. 
And this is a few of my, this is my uncle again, a few of my family members. And the interesting thing about working with this particular material um, is, of course, you know, you have all the connotations that come along with prison, but I really wanted to focus in specifically on their experience. And I also thought about people that are not familiar with prison photography or may have not have people who've been incarcerated, how they could connect to the work itself. Um, and through, again, this element of family, this element of connection and maintaining um, those relationships. And, you know, people have the struggle in maintaining those relationships depending on the circumstance. But here you, you really find um, a sense of importance in, I feel like the, the foundation of photography is really expressed in this environment. Um, when you think about photography and the essence of it, you know, when you, again, when they were leaving uh, prison, the most important um, artifacts that they would leave with, they would always say it would be the letters and the photos. So you think about here in society, how we may take some of these things for granted, um, especially in the digital age with Instagram and social media. But here, having a photographer coming around, I mean, you're working in the yard, having all of these various jobs, whether you're a chef, um, a cook, a clean, uh, cleaning in the prison, and you're using the little funds that you are able to gather to spend on precious items such as uh, a photograph. And it's something that I think that, you know, we take for granted. Um, so in this particular letter, written from Uncle Almonte to Mother Uncle Andre, it says, um, to Donnie, fat boy, I love you, bro. Keep your head up. We will see the outside and do it like old times. From your little brother, Big Al, the dark side. See, the other aspect, um, as I was combing through this material, again, focusing on the visiting room, is the duration of, uh, you know, thinking about time, also thinking about history. This is my uncle with his son over a course of 11 years. And uh, my uncle, who loves this piece, but he hates the fact that he's reminded about the weight that he gained being in prison. So you often ask me if I kind of could reverse it to make it seem like he slimmed down. <laughs> but I mean, it was really dear to me because on the other hand, you know, my uncles were locked up for the majority of um, my upbringing. So it was able to, it was a, a way to kind of connect with them through my person as an artist, but also finding like this connection that we can kind of build upon. So it was really interesting in collaborating with them Again, I wanted to produce something out of this particular material. I'm just showing you a couple pieces from the series uh, that really stayed true to who they are and also was very sensitive to those that um, are connected to this particular type of experience. Uh, one interesting element about uh, photography in prison is that anyone, for the most part, can be a photographer. You just need a clean record um, and once you apply, um, the warden gives you a camera and allows you to take some test shots. And if they come out well, then you're designated the uh, prison photographer. So it's the element of archiving and all these photographers are unknown. Even some of the artists and muralists that you see in the backdrops are un unknown to add another layer to the work. Um, and it's something that I'm interested in pursuing and developing this body of work further. The other element of my practice as it extended beyond found photography um, was the strategy of appropriation and using um, video. Uh, so, you know, I've been able to create a few pieces, but the very first piece um, was an attempt in creating this video portrait of uh, Dr. King. And then I landed on this one particular interview. Um, it was Dr. King um, being interviewed by three journalists. Um, and it was for the United States Information Agency. Uh, the interview is about 30 minutes long, 
But what's interesting about this particular uh, interview, the press conference um, was distributed internationally, um, but it was not distributed internationally, or it was not distributed in the United States until 12 years after its original broadcast. So it was broadcast in 1963, but it wasn't available in the U.S. until 1975. So I found that to be really interesting because as I'm combing through, I'm finding a lot of videos that, um, you know, the general public may be aware of, but I thought this particular clip people may not be so uh, much familiar with. So I was able to uh, re uh, strip down the audio, um, edit the video to kind of create this portrait, and we're going to play it for you guys here. Without uh, regards to race, nationality, or religion. Now, by public facilities, I take it you include privately owned facilities and make those public. Yes, I would include uh, privately owned facilities that are publicly sustained and dependent on the very public for their survival. Uh, I'm not speaking of one's home again. But I am and speaking of this method of working um, really began to kind of open up my practice. Uh, and, you know, till, until this day, this is still one of my favorite pieces. Um, it's really kind of my homage to Dr. King. Um, also, I'm attempting to create one for Malcolm X, but finding archival footage has been much more difficult. I'm opposed to, you know, searching for Dr. King. Um, I've been able, you know, initially this started as an idea as a video projection, um, but I've been able to show it and exhibit in a variety of uh, ways. As far as their manners are concerned, but I do not think any proprietor should have the right to deny a person. Uh, so these are a few of my pieces. Um, I would like to go back to these particular works. Um, again, what makes this particular piece, again, is one of the most more personal pieces of mine. My uncle on the left passed away two years ago. Um, so when I was asked to speak here at the Porter Colloquium, I, want, you know, I was thinking about which works I really wanted to focus on. And I thought this would be a great opportunity. I mean, this is a, a huge platform to be able to speak briefly about my uncle and about these particular pieces. Um, and also has given me courage to uh, dive more into some of the source material that he left behind. Um, it's something that's been very difficult. Um, I did second guess myself in preparing for um, the colloquium and, and what I was going to present. Um, but, you know, it kind of speaks to, again, the importance of photography, the importance of archiving and preserving um, photographs, uh, and again, pr uh, preserving our history. I'm also in the process of um, creating an archiving business that will um, serve uh, largely the African-American community in digitizing um, archival photographs, vintage photographs, videos. Because um, again, as I began to work in the medium of found photography and searching for photographs, whether it was online or through flea markets, I found that largely the images I was coming across were being controlled and sold by people that didn't look like me, right? So I wanted to create a platform um, where we are in control of our images. And as we move, as we progress into this uh, technological age, we have a platform that works well in serving our community. Um, and again, I think it was rooted as I began to think back in the process that it started here with these particular images. Uh, so these are my works. Again, thank you again for allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you.